so much for joining us. We are here today. I'm Dr. Jennifer Cook, and I am faculty at the University of Cincinnati in Heart Failure, and I have Dr. Jeremy Hudson and Dr. Divya Campella, who are residents with us at UC, who are going to present a case, and we're going to be discussing inotrope selection. Let's see here. There we go. Okay. Dr. Hudson, would you like to get us started? Yes, ma'am. Um, so this case is a 72-year-old Caucasian male with a past medical history of atrial fibrillation, type 2 diabetes, and non-ischemic cardiomyopathy that presents to the hospital with shortness of breath, nausea, and vomiting. He states that he has some increased shortness of breath for the last few days with increasing abdominal girth. On his exam, blood pressure was noted to be 88 over 45, a methyl 59, heart rate of 92. He's afebrile, but there's decreased breath sound by lateral with crackles. On labs, his creatinine was noted to be 2.2, a raise from his base of 1.4. ASC and ALT are both elevated to the low 300s. High sensitivity troponin is at 25. Lactate was elevated at 2.5. On EKG, he's tacky with non-specific non T-wave changes in leads V3 and V6. On imaging, chest x-ray show blunting of the costal phrenic angles bilaterally along with curly lines. So this is our case, Dr. Cook. Well, I mean, it certainly sounds like a sick guy. So if we take a look at this presentation, we take a look at this patient, the first thing that I like to do when I'm assessing a patient is to figure out where they fit in the four quadrants, the four heart failure quadrants. And this was famously published um, by Dr. Lynn Warner Stevenson a number of years ago. And so Dr. Campello, where would you say that this patient fits in the four quadrants of heart failure? I think probably wet and cold. We see signs of volume overload. We've got an elevated lactate hypotension. So that makes me concerned that we're in the bottom lower quadrant. I, I absolutely agree with you. And so just to kind of orient for people who may not be familiar with the quadrants as far as how they work is that we have congestion. So on the left-hand side, we have patients that are dry or not congested and on the right, congested. And so signs of congestion, and our patient has some of these, so JVD, hepatojugular reflux, peripheral edema, and S3 on exam, or subject, subjective, and so a, co a combination of subjective and also physical exam findings. And then on the, I guess we could say, y-axis, we have perfusion. And so um, perfusion, we have patients who are cold, so have decreased perfusion, so a low cardiac output versus those that might be warm. Actually, I've had some people before get confused about cold and warm, thinking it means like the temperature of the body, but in that can be confusing because we do know that if you have cold extremities, it's usually a sign of, of um, poor perfusion. Yeah. And so other signs of um, poor perfusion would be low, low urine output. So somebody who's ulgaric, altered mental status or um, inadequate response to diuretic. And so perfusion, we consider to be as cardiac output, uh, but also a great surrogate of, of that is blood pressure. And Dr. Hudson, our patient is pretty hypotensive. And so that suggests that the perfusion is low. And the yes, congestion sir. is um, can be thought of as the pulmonary capillary wedge pressure um, for our patients that have swans in. Like if we swan this patient, we probably would find a pretty high wedge pressure. But also, as we know, the pulmonary capillary wedge pressure is estimating our left ventricular and diastolic pressure. And that's really physiologically what is elevated in these patients who have structural heart disease. And so one way that we are beginning to look at this is by using the sky shock stages. So Dr. Campella, will you take us through this and tell us where you think our patient is for the sky shock classification? Absolutely. So this figure shows the sky stages ranging from stage A through stage E. Stage E describes, or stage A, excuse me, describes patients who are at risk for developing cardiogenic shock all the way through stage E, where patients are essentially on maximal life support requiring ongoing CPR or ECMO. In between, stage B describes patients who have hypotension or tachycardia, but still don't have signs of hypoperfusion. Stage C describes patients with hypoperfusion who need additional interventions beyond just volume resuscitation, and then stage D describes patients who are unfortunately deteriorating and not responding to initial interventions. So based off of what we see from our patient right now, I would probably classify them as stage C. 
I would agree with you. And I think that this is really helpful because as the sky's shock classifications are emerging, we're being able to use this in the clinical setting when we're communicating. For instance, when I get a call from a referring physician that's got a patient in cardiogenic shock and need to communicate that patient to the CCAT team or to others, uh, maybe on my interventionalist who I need to have help, you know, putting an appellate in, um, using these classifications can really help. And so in our next slide, we have a little bit more detailed description. And so um, Dr. Hudson, take us through this slide as far as the presentation that you said, um, would you agree that the patient fits in C? Yes, I, I most definitely think he has uh, acute heart failure. Um, and then going by this chart, as you can see on C row, um, that you see that his lactate, uh, anything with a lactate above two, his uh, our patient uh, lactate was 2.2. Um, creatinine doubled uh, and had a, mm -hmm. uh, doubled all the way up to 2.2, uh, along with increased um, liver function tests. Uh, unfortunately, the provider who admitted him did not include uh, a brain natriuretic protein, so um, that will be additional information, but I do surmise that it will be elevated greatly in this case. Absolutely. And of course, we don't have a swan in this patient. Um, so we're not looking at hemodynamics, but we can imagine what the hemodynamics would show in this situation. Absolutely. So that brings us to this question. So which would you support in terms of cardiac support? So this is what we're here to talk about today is inotropes and inotrope selection. So we have our patient. And so what do each of you think? It's kind of tough. Um, I think I would do A, Miranol. Okay. Dr. Capella? I think I would opt for, for dopamine in this situation. Okay. All right. Well, let's take it step by step. So why don't we start with dobutamine? Why would you choose dobutamine? So dobutamine, kind of talking first about the mechanism of action, has the strongest affinity for beta-1 receptors. And that's the main utility of it as an inotrope because it increases heart rate, increases myocardial contractility, and therein lies its role in cardiogenic shock. It does also have effects on both the alpha-1 and beta-2 receptors and can cause mild vasodilation, which is most prominent at lower doses. And then as we increase the dose up to around 15, sometimes you can see a sustained increase in contractility without really affecting the vascular resistance. At higher doses, vasoconstriction is a predominant effect we see because of dobutamine's effect on the alpha-1 receptors. Mm -hmm. Talking a little bit about dosing, there is no need for a loading dose with dobutamine. Initial dosing starts at around one microgram per kilogram per minute, and has a very short half-life, around two minutes. Mm -hmm. Big limitations and side effects to talk about with dobutamine, um, specifically that it is arrhythmogenic. Specifically because of its sympathomimetic activity, it can cause hypertension and tachycardia, and that, in turn, can increase myocardial oxygen consumption, which is one of the reasons we opt not to use dobutamine in situations with acute coronary syndrome, because we don't want to worsen the ischemic burden. Another limitation is that tolerance can develop after just a few days. So after a few days, patients might not respond as well as they did initially. And overall, we like to limit use in patients with left main stem disease, again, because of the ischemic burden, severe hypertension, and then hypokalemia, because that would probably worsen um, arrhythmias. That's a great summary. Thank you for that. Um, how about the opposite side then? So the opposite side of the equation, milrinone. Dr. Hudson, you want to tell us about milrinone? So milrinone. Milrinone, uh, in this case, and overall, would improve cardiac uh, conductility and improve cardiac relaxin, uh, both of which would improve cardiac outflow and decrease cardiac oxygen consumption. Uh, Mirinol basically works by inhibiting uh, the phosphodiesterase three um, that's normally present within the smooth muscles of our blood vessels and in cardiac uh, psychoplasmic reticulum. Um, this pre prevents a metabolism of cyclic GMP, res resulting in uh, dilation of the venous and arterial systems. Um, the fusion rate is um, around 0 0.125 uh, to about 0 0.75 uh, micrograms per kilogram per minute. Um, and unlike dobutamine, uh, it does have a slightly higher uh, half-life, about two to four hours. 
And I, that's the uh, effusion, right? And this is the mechanism of action. Um, if you remember your histology or biochemistry, um, this is how uh, mirinone acts. It acts at the green dot, on the green letters right here at that PDE3. It inhibits that to cause increase of CAMP, which would increase uh, contractility. Mm -hmm. Inhibiting, increasing CAMP. More beta stimulation, yeah, yep. more contraction. Now, there are some warnings and contraindications with mineralone. It's not a perfect drug. Um, it does tend to accumulate in patients that have some type of kidney disease, whether that be ESRD or AKI and things of that nature. Um, we also try to avoid it with people with severe heart failure or severe pulmonary hypertension. Because it can cause vasodilation, um, it can worsen uh, perfusion and oxygenation in the lungs. Um, the bigger the pulmonary arteries are, the more that fluid can leak out and worsen um, the pulmonary edema and that pulmonary hypertension. Um, it also, just like dubutamine, has a non-dose dependent uh, ability to cause arrhythmias. That can unfortunately lead to a sudden cardiac death and ischemia. So to summarize, I'd say the benefits of dobutamine are that it's fast acting and that it is um, something that can be titrated quickly. The drawback is that it can lead to more arrhythmias. Mm -hmm. Whereas milrinone has, um, although it can cause arrhythmias, it's less known to cause arrhythmias, but has a really long half-life and needs to be brought on, um, takes between two to four hours to get to maximum dose. And so here we have a, a figure that shows us a comparison of dobutamine and melanone. And so we can see that they're both used for low cardiac output. One thing that's mentioned in this figure that we haven't talked about yet is the bolusing of melanone. And actually the melanone bolus is something that we don't typically use in the intensive care unit. It has been used um, or it can be used by anesthesia in patients that are being supported for cardiothoracic surgery coming off bypass that need melanone. But typically we're starting melanone and letting it accumulate over two to four hours. So what happened with our patient, Dr. Hudson? So in this case, uh, because of the hypertension and evidence of hyperperfusion that Dr. Campella uh, so brilliantly uh, laid out, uh, we decided to give dibutamine at five uh, micrograms per kilogram per minute. Uh, unfortunately, the patient did uh, develop a um, arrhythmia with a fifth RER uh, that we treated with an amyo bolus, amyodarone bolus. Um, once that happened, we started Mirano, uh, and then four hours later, we stopped the uh, debutamine after Mirano set in. Um, the patient's uh, stabilized, um, and all his in organ uh, functions on the serum uh, chemistries improved. That's great. What a great example. And so basically, we took a patient who had Sky C shock and turned him into a patient with. Um, stable shock instead of deteriorating shock. And so this has been a success all around. Yes, it was <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> all right. Thank you so much for, for doing this with me today. This has been a lot of fun. Uh, and we really everybody enjoys it. <laughs> all right.